Well, we've got a lot of other very distinguished panellists with us this evening, so I'm hoping it's going to be quite a, an exciting, not aggressive, but exciting um, conversation. Uh, first, we've got, um, where are we here? First, we've got Richard Werner, who um, is Director of the Centre of Banking, Finance and Sustainable Development at the University of Southampton. Now, Richard's contribution is going to be particularly interesting, I hope, because he's got a lot of uh, Japanese experience. So he's followed uh, and been involved in a huge financial crisis before. We were actually in Japan around the same time, um, but I was a junior broker while he was rather more important. So while he was off... Uh, advising the Ministry of Finance how to deal with things. I was getting drunk with clients in bars in Roppongi. So please don't, don't direct your questions to him. Um, he's also written a book, The Princes of the Yen, which was a number one bestseller in Japan. Um, and uh, I, can we get it here? We, we, we can't really yet. It is yet. Uh, M.E. Sharp, an American publisher, but it's available. Amazon, I think. Does so you go on Amazon, you can, you can pay a fortune to an American publisher and get it, but perhaps he'll give us the gist of it at some point this evening. $20. $20, okay, fine. Something. Not so much. So some good contributions there, I hope. We've also got um, Anne Pettifer with us this evening, which is, she's given me a terrible scare already this evening by sending out a tweet at about 3.30 saying that she just got on the train at King's Cross, which left me completely floored. Um, but it turns out that she was just sending it out a little late. And here she is with us. <laughs> Yeah. Anne is, is best known for um, her work on the, uh, the Jubilee 2000, putting the, the debts of the, the poorest countries around us uh, on the national stage, international stage. Um, she also predicted an Anglo-American debt deflationary crisis back in 2003, um, along with you. In fact, we've got two predictors on the panel, two people who told us exactly what it was going to happen before it did happen. She's also co-author of the Green New Deal, a fellow of the New Economics Foundation and a director of the think tank Policy Research and Macroeconomics. Third, we have Tony Greenham, who I'm sorry to have to tell you did not predict the crisis, um, <laughs> but probably has some, some other useful insights to give us. He is head of finance and business at the New Economics Foundation, uh, leads the program of research into the reform of the financial sector. Um, he's qualified as a charter accountant, so that puts him way ahead of most of the rest of us on understanding the numbers, and has worked in the UK equity capital markets in various different places. So we've got a great panel here. I hope you will ask lots of interesting questions. I can see you raring to go. I am watching the feed on Twitter, uh, so I can see that quite a few of you already have um, things you would like to get out of your systems. So who would like to start? OK, right here. Oh, God, sorry. I completely forgot. Everyone has to give a little speech first. I don't. I don't. No, nope, I'm sorry. We're going to have to come back to your question. So distracted by everyone having predicted the crisis, I've forgotten what we're supposed to do. So let's, let's start with you, Richard. And we're going to ask everyone to speak for 10 minutes. Then you can ask your questions, OK? So keep them in your heads. Do not forget the questions. And you are the first question. Thanks very much. <laughs> and thank you, you for, the, an for the great introduction. Thank you, Mary. Uh, and and uh, I'm very... Uh, pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thanks to the organizers, Beth and uh, everyone else sponsoring. Um, I would like to give my, my own brief answers to the three questions um, and then do what we are tasked to do, uh, discuss Adam's uh, inter interesting contribution. Um, and uh, before I do that, I just want to explain a, a few fundamental points in the taxi, um, here I asked the taxi driver, um, who do you think creates and allocates the majority of the money supply? And I apologize for asking such a technical question. I'd explained I'm a sort of, you know, academic, that sort of thing. But, you know, the question is, although it uses a lot of technical terms, I think it's reasonably understandable. Who creates and allocates the money supply in this country? Um, and the answer was the Bank of England, and I think that's fair enough. And um, certainly, you know, working at the Bank of England, I'm sure you um, will have encountered that this this is what is the general understanding. This is also what I think is, is, is how the media portrays the process of money supply um, contribution and so on. Of course, the fact is that the Bank of England creates 3% of the money supply. So the question then is, and I did, so I said, well, 
Okay, fair enough, but that's only 3%. Who creates and allocates, according to their own decisions, the 97% of the money supply in this country? Um, the taxi driver offered an interesting answer, which I don't think is going to lead us too far um, along the right course here. Germany. <laughs> which uh, is, an, is interesting thinking, and, and clearly, you know, has to do with all this going on and with, with the European debt crisis and ECB and Germany paying for everyone and so on. So, okay, fair enough. But I think that can't be the answer because, of course, the UK is not part of the European monetary system. And so I explained, well, actually, it's in the UK and it is profit-oriented enterprises that have been given this right, this license, um, in fact, it's the biggest privatization on record that took place without any public discussion. It's the banking system. The banks don't lend money, they create money. When they say they give out a loan, actually, they're creating money out of nothing, which also creates the deposits um, out of nothing, which are circulating, that is the money supply. Now, if you have never heard this, well, you're at the right conference. Um, I hope you'll all be there tomorrow as well. There'll be much more details and talk about this. Um, but as for now, if you've never heard this, it may be initially a little bit hard to, uh, to accept this. Take my word for it. There's much um, evidence and backup for this. In fact, even central banks have very well hidden statements, sometimes very well hidden statements, um, that admit this. So that it's a fact. Uh, that banks create the money supply. Now, I think this is an important fact that we should keep in mind when we discuss um, banking, the role of banking in, in, in the economy and society, and, and then also in answering these questions, banking crises and how to deal with them and how to get banks to contribute to society. There's a fundamental rule, it's very simple. When banks create money and it's used for productive purposes, um, contributing to GDP and leading to the production of new goods and services or increasing productivity. This is sound lending that generates the income streams that will enable the servicing of those loans that have been created out of thin air and also the ultimate repayment of, of, of the principal. And so that's sound banking leading to economic growth without inflation and without banking crises. So it's a very simple rule. Um, when banks create credit and it's used productively for the production of new goods and services or increasing productivity. But when banks create money, which is called lending, um, but it's creating money, um, and the money is used for unproductive purposes, and there are particularly two obvious varieties uh, for consumption. You can immediately see what happens if banks uh, create a lot of money for consumer loans that means the money supply is increasing. Every loan adds to the money supply. It's a fact. And so then you have a lot of money creation as used for consumption. So more money, the same amount of goods and services. Well, you're going to have inflation, of course. Um, that was more obvious in the 70s, and uh, that's become um, much more closely watched also by central banks. So um, it's been a bit of less of an, uh, of an issue. But there's the other type of dangerous and unproductive bad bank lending, bank credit, and that's when banks create credit and lend uh, for transactions that do not even contribute to GDP and not part of GDP. They cannot contribute to national income, and therefore, in a macro sense, they can't generate the sustainable income flows um, to repay those loans, service and repay those loans, and that is bank credit for non-GDP transactions, financial transactions. And that includes also property transactions. Um, and when banks do that a lot, and banks tend to do similar things to each other so that you know, they act in, uh, in, in common, move in step, and then, of course, you can see what happens then. You get a lot of money creation injected into one asset market. And I would argue um, that in that sense, of course, all bubbles are very similar because there's money creation by the banking system and whether it's for tulips or for stocks as in America in the 1920s which had a massively negative impact on the um, US economy, employment, even um, 
death rates in America, starvation existed in the 30s, um, or property or housing, commercial or real estate, uh, uh, private property, it has a big impact. It initially has to drive up asset prices because there's money being created and injected. And so that's the fundamental rule. You know, there's more money, given amount of, of anything, then prices go up. But it's un unsustainable. It seems sustainable initially because it generates uh, these capital gains and capital gains expectations. Everyone's happy to join the game, um, but it's unsustainable and uh, the money can't be repaid ultimately. So then it's very easy to actually identify these bubbles. You just need to watch bank credit disaggregated by industry, by use. Um, many central banks provide this data. Those that don't, I think, should and easily could provide the data. The banks certainly have all the data and can make it available. And so with this in mind, we can answer those questions very quickly. And there's also looking at my stopwatch here. Um, so how to deal with banking crises? Uh, well, how to avoid banking crisis? I'll answer that one first. Um, restrict bank credit for transactions that contribute to GDP and ideally for productive um, transactions uh, to, to that. So only allow basically credit for productive purposes and ban, or if you want to have a quota uh, severely limited of bank credit for unproductive, particularly non-GDP financial transactions. Um, how do we encourage banks to, to lend productively and how, you know, basically do exactly what I've just said. Well, you restrict the bad stuff by regulation. We have lots of bank regulations. And if you look at banks that don't lend for speculation and don't pay high bonuses and have not gone bust in the crisis, such as credit unions, they have more restrictions on them than any other banks. So there are restrictions, but it's just that the big banks are not restricted in doing the harmful bank credit creation to the financial sector, and that could be restricted. Um, how do we get more social and also local activity of banks to support from banks for um, local economy and, and also small firms? Well, you need to have the right banking sector consisting of many small firms. In banking, we don't have economies of scale. We have diseconomies of scale. Because the bigger the bank gets, the more it's likely to engage in the harmful type of bank lending, bank credit creation for, for speculation, for financial transactions. You know, when you're Lloyds Bank and your balance sheet is 2,000 billion pounds and you're working towards shareholder value maximization, which is what they're supposed to do, sadly, even under government ownership, the government has decided not to really change much in, in that outlook. Well, you want to grow. 5%, 10%? Well, if you want to grow 10%, you've got to add 200 billion to your balance sheet, and banks do that by creating credit, bank lending. So you've got to lend 200 billion more every year. Well, what are you going to say when, when um, small firm, small shop owner comes to the bank branch and asks for a 20,000 pound loan? How many of those do you need for 200 billion? I mean, it's millions of those. That's much more work. Why not lend 200 million to a bunch of uh, hedge funds for speculation, much more attractive, bigger bonuses, so they're likely to do it. So you can restrict that, and you can have a banking sector that consists of many, many small locally headquartered banks, as is the case, for example, in Germany, where you've got over a thousand banks. Every small town would have several locally headquartered banks. They're small. They want to lend 20,000 pound loans, 10,000 pound loans to small firms, and they know the people. So you need to change the structure of the banking sector. Um, and they also tend not to lend for speculation. So you've solved those problems um, with that banking structure. And just if I am allowed a minute commenting, therefore, I think you can, from this, you can sort of guess my comments on, on Adam's proposals. Um, I would suggest, and, and Adam's probably not surprised to hear this, that of course they, they, they're somewhat still conservative in that they, they don't tackle the banking sector head on. The proposal to introduce taxes, yes, and I agree, you know, it, it probably won't do harm. And Adam said that other proposals sort of, you know, uh, he's not against and they sort of could work together. But we're not tackling directly the cause. We need to ask why do we have these problems also in the housing sector? It's because of bank credit too much. So we can restrict that directly. How do we encourage SME financing, small firm financing? Well, instead of encouraging securitization, which was the problem with the subprime uh, 
um, crisis, which, was, uh, which is the problem in the European sovereign debt crisis, securitization of debt, sovereign debt. You know, they could have debt not in the, in the securitized markets, then you would have much less of this bond crisis. Um, the solution, therefore, I think is, again, to look at bank uh, credit provision directly and not um, the debt markets as such. S securitized um, debt doesn't actually create new money, but we need money creation for growth. So there is a need for money creation. It's a question who does it and for what purpose, and that's where we have to focus. Um, so I would probably agree most with the last point and would encourage Adam to work more into the last point and um, why not evolve that into a more targeted program at changing the structure of the banking system in the UK. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was 12 and a half minutes, so he ran over, but we're going to forgive him because of his very funny joke at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and move on to Anne. Is that okay? Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm also really thrilled to be here. I'm thrilled by this alliance of Fred Friends of the Earth, um, Unison, and Triodos Bank. This is an extraordinary achievement. I'm so impressed with Beth, who I think will be Prime Minister one day, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So bossy and pushy, is she? Um, and I'm also really honoured to be on a panel uh, with um, Adam Posen. I read his speeches avidly. I think he's one of the most progressive members of the board of the Bank of England. The speech that he made in September, I think it was, 2011, in which he said to policymakers, we can do more, and he attacked what he called policy defeatism, was something that really rang true with me and that I was very pleased to hear said by such a prominent and distinguished um, economist. And I'm saying all this because I'm about to be very rude to him. And <laughs> oh, he, yes, I should have let you sit next to him, but maybe not. <laughs> he will know that's the English way, you know, to begin with sort of... But I wanted to put that in because I do feel that sincerely. And I wanted to tackle him, like Richard, I agree that that I have no problem with point three about British fetishism for banking. And so I don't particularly want to touch on that, but I do want to touch on the first two points that he made. And I feel very strongly about this, so I'm gonna have a little rant here. In which he talked about boom and bust. And he said, he quoted um, Reinhardt and Rogoff's famous book, uh, This Time It's Different, in which they catalog very carefully all the financial crises through history. And it's a rather amazing and wonderful book. Um, and the rise of debt and what happens to debt um, throughout history. And he says, he argues here today that, that there's very little we can do about boom and bust and said that uh, it's a recurring problem, uh, were his words, throughout modern history. Now, I get very cross with uh, Reinhardt and Rogoff because of the way in which they interpret their own data and their own charts. But I also I get very cross because policymakers have such a huge blind spot for a critical period in history, a period which is known to all economists as the golden age. And I would have you know that it is part of modern history. I know because I lived through part of it, 1945 until 1971. And I want to quote to Adam, because he probably knows this, a quote from the wonderful historian of financial crises, Barry Eichen Green and Lindet, who opens up his book on international debt crises in historical perspective with this. He says, the three decades following World War II seem to have been a golden era of tranquility in <coughs> international capital markets. A fulfillment of the benediction, may you live in dull times. And for those of us who grew up in the 1950s, they were indeed dull times. <laughs> Sovereign defaults and liquidity crises were relatively rare. That's how his book opens. And it's a period in history, the Bretton Woods era, which was governed largely by ideas from one of the greatest economists of all time, John Maynard Keynes, which restrained finance, which managed the financial system. 
which believed that you could not have stability, you could not have employment, you could not have productive investment, so long as the financial system was not managed. And Keynes was ferocious about this. He had lived through a vast credit bubble. And I'd like to disagree again with Adam about the point about housing bubbles being worse than others. The stock market bub bubble in the 1920s en enveloped large numbers of innocent, foolish, unwise people who lost huge amounts. Now, they're not, it was not quite as big as the housing bubble, but even so, it did impact very closely on individuals, um, many, many individuals. The fact of the matter is that easy money, easy and dear money, as Keynes would have it, goes after assets, whatever those assets are. And in the housing bubble of the 1980s and 90s, it was the very last asset they could get their hands on. They'd done works of art, they'd done racehorses, they'd done stocks and shares, they'd done bonds you know, after the last remaining assets. You know, the hairdresser in Michigan on $7 an hour who had nowhere to live and who was desperate for a loan of $300,000 to put a roof over her head and willing to pay, I don't know, 8, 9, 13% for that loan. And who was fraudulently and corruptly lent the money by the banks. So, you know, easy money, as Richard has just said, easy credit, the banks create this out of thin air, effortlessly. They used to assess risk before they made loans, but now they virtually don't. When I took out my first mortgage, I had to sit in front of the bank manager with my husband, who inquired as to the state of our marital relationship <laughs> and whether or not it was sustainable over 25 years of a mortgage. <laughs> this was very personal probing. Um, my son applying for a similar mortgage doesn't get that kind of scrutiny. So they don't do risk assessment anymore, but they do go after the last remaining asset and they exploited it, you know. So the fact is this, that we lived through a period of 30 years of stability of managed finance where central banks took control of these banks, managed the credit creation process, managed above all the price paid for credit and for new loans, the rate of interest, the cost of borrowing. And they did this through the most powerful economic tool available to us called capital control. Now, you're not allowed to use the word capital control in polite company in Britain these days, but increasingly there are countries, more than 14, 15, and there are countries that are really important to the global economy that are applying capital controls because they want to manage their economies. They don't want to be victims to a global financial system that is careless and irresponsible. And we have our fetish, fetish for banking, as, as Adam rightly says, and we are quite prepared to lie down and effectively, I'm not gonna use this word actually, but effectively <laughs> be done over by our banking system. It is, it's a tragic, it's a tragedy and it's okay for those of us who may have paid off our mortgages and who may be beyond the worst of it, but it is an enormous personal tragedy for people losing their homes and their jobs. <laughs> and thanks to the massive injections of liquidity by the central banks, and thanks also to something called forbearance by the banks, and thanks to measures put in place by the Labour government, we have not yet even started to see the full consequences of this crisis. People are sitting on mortgages they cannot repay, but they've been allowed to stay in their homes. They haven't been forced to go through what's happening in the United States of America, where 15% of individual private debts have been, been written down, and people's homes have been foreclosed upon. There was an incident last week where a man shot the sheriff and the bailiff that came to evict him from his condominium. And the 100 police were called in and the, the condominium was burnt down. That kind of thing that's happening in the United States hasn't even started here. But I warn you, it is still to come. So, you know, I, I just despair of the way in which we dismiss, first of all, one of the greatest geniuses that Britain has produced, someone on, on a par with Darwin, but who doesn't get the credit that Darwin gets.
Secondly, that we dismiss a period in our history when actually we helped the world stabilize the global economy after the biggest financial crisis of 1929 and so on. And we do this, in my view, for very political reasons. It's so easy to blindside that period. It's so easy for the banks to persuade us that uh, managing, managing finance is what Carmen Reinhardt calls financial repression, and none of us is in favor of repression. That kind of distortion of history and of reality has got us into this mess, and until we begin to accept the truth and the wisdom of that period, we're never gonna get out of it. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Anne. I suspect we're gonna be coming back to quite a lot of those points. Right, Tony. Thank you, Marin. Um, uh, can I predict the next financial crisis now, so that the next time? <laughs> And then, um, great. So I, I, I'll, I'll try and be brief, and actually I think I'll compliment, I sort of agree largely with, with much of what's been said by the other panelists. I want to address a sort of, given, given the sponsors of this, this conference, a sort of um, a couple of points about the debate, about the political debate, if you like, a, a, around banking reform. And uh, I want to make two points, really. One is that um, banking is unique as an industry and, and um, particularly Richard has explained uh, one key reason why that's so, it actually can create money. But uh, the other point I'd like to make is that the, we need to assess banking reform by the actual outcomes in social and environmental and economic terms that, that come out of it. So the first point about banking is unique. Well, that's, that, that sounds perhaps like an uncontroversial statement, but the reason why I want to make it is that a lot of the language around the, uh, the Vickers Commission and the Treasury Select Committee and other um, sort of policy circles around banking reform has been about competition and, you know, we just need to make, make banking a bit more like, you know, car manufacturing or a bit more like the supermarkets and so on and so forth. Well, this is fundamentally misconceived, uh, in, in my view. Um, it, and, and it's largely to do with uh, the, the reason that Richard has just explained, that, that banks actually get to determine how much money is created and, and where it is allocated within the economy. Banking is the operating system of the economy. If it crashes, it takes everything with it. To compare it to supermarkets, say, is, is, is I think, um, totally unhelpful. And I mean, I'm going to pick up here on a comment that was made by Peter Sands, who's the chief executive of Standard Chartered, who was very critical recently of the Financial Policy Committee. Uh, in seeking to um, have powers, uh, at least, that would uh, enable it to influence the allocation uh, of credit to, you know, in between, say, property and, and other sectors of the economy in order to try and prevent the sort of um, asset bubbles building up that um, Adam mentioned. And he, and he sort of, you know, he, he said this is sort of 1970s style sort of central planning. And he actually said, if this were car manufacturing, it would be the equivalent of having a central committee deciding how many cars to be produced and how many should be four by fours, small hatchbacks, and so on. Well, I don't want to be critical of, of a senior, actually, no, hold on, I do want to be critical of a senior banker uh, in the UK. I mean, uh, to compare cars with credit is ridiculous in, in, my, in, in, my, in my view. It has no great economic significance collectively whether we choose to drive in, around in one car as opposed to another car. Okay, I'm happy to leave that to the free market. Uh, but it makes an enormous economic, social, and environmental difference where credit gets allocated to what activity and who gets to use it. Um, and so the point is that however much you might like to completely privatize banking, you never can. It is essentially a state uh, backed enterprise because the state stands behind it at all times. We've seen this. We've seen the demonstration of this. It was only the state that could rescue the banking system because the state guarantees st sits behind money. It, the acceptability of money, money is guaranteed by the state. So there is a very strong public interest in banking that is just makes it utterly different from cars, supermarkets, or anything else. And to ignore that fundamental point uh, is, is, to, is to sort of essentially mean that we can never really uh, make sure that the that banking does properly serve the public interest, which is, I think, our collective, one of our main collective points about gathering here today. And I, I'll just sort of briefly move on to the second point about, well, judging banking reform by the impacts. We at NEF have been very disappointed by the fact that it seems that none of the uh, real discussions of reform uh, around banking after the crash uh, 
have started with asking the question, what do we think banking is for? You know, what is the purpose of it? I mean, we, we define the purpose of it as the allocation of economic resources, which is sort of fairly uncontroversial, to ecologically sustainable activities that maximize long-term social and financial value. Now, that's not a definition that you, you'll see, you know, trotted out by uh, a banker or, or perhaps even um, central bankers, although maybe Adam would like to comment on that. But if you miss out the environmental and the social aspect from banking, then how can you possibly expect the end results of, of the banking system's activities to be either socially just or environmentally sustainable? And so we need to start and judge any uh, reconstruction of the banking system or banking reform by social and environmental, as well as uh, the impact on, on, e on economic prosperity. And so I think I, that the final point I want to make on that, for both those two reasons, I think I'm very encouraged that this conference has been convened and that there are bodies involved in it, NGOs, trade unions. Um, the ci civil society needs to stand up and to assert its voice in the debate on banking reform and say, you know, you can't tell us we don't understand banking, we don't understand economics, and therefore we have to leave it to the experts, which is roughly the line that the BBA trots out and Angela Knight trots out. You know, these clever, well-meaning bankers can sort it out uh, for us. Well, no, we, we have a legitimate voice because we can see what the impacts are, and it hasn't all been all right, and the environmental destruction uh, that is caused by people that bank, banks lend money to is partly their responsibility. The social consequences of, of, of financial exclusion, or indeed of banking crashes, is partly the bank's, bank's responsibility. And we care about those, and our voice it needs to be taken into account in those processes. And so thanks for all coming to this conference, and thanks to uh, Friends of Earth Scotland for um, inspiring it to happen. Okay, well, thank you very much. I think the basic message here is that everyone wants to restrict credit. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, we've got lots of questions, I know, and I'm so sorry about before, and I'm going to... Actually, I will do say, you are a very polite audience. I'm watching the Twitter stream, and not one single person has tweeted that idiot Merring got it all wrong, so I really appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, have we got a microphone? First question, just over here, please. Hi, my name is Deepa Govindarajan, I'm from the University of Reading, and I'd like to offer for Adam's consideration, really, um, two, two points. The first being that I think I'd like to offer the analogy of a three-legged stool, and initially regulators were focusing on micro-firm level regulation and supervision of individual firms without challenging business models. Now our intelligent and clever econometricians are very happy with dealing with macro prudential and systemic issues and how to prick bubbles. But a third leg of this three-legged stool, stool, which is the most important leg in my view, is the behavioral, the incentive related and the governance structures within banks and whether regulators are charged with promoting the city or protecting the interests of not just shareholders and short-term speculators, but a broader group of stakeholders, and that we should avoid the lobbying by trade associations, which forces us to believe that all financial regulation is repressive and all financial innovation is good. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't know, that was yeah. directly for you. Um, despite my as expected, turning somehow into Mrs. Thatcher by the end of the evening, <laughs> um, which, which is a very good perspective for me to have because you must realize that in most of the meetings I go to, even if Anne was just saying it for show, I'm considered the bomb-throwing radical. Um, so let, let me just pick up on what Deepa from Reading was, was saying and, and link it to a couple things that were said on the panel really quickly. Um, I, I think you're right that there is fundamentally an issue of governance. And that's why I very much applaud what Tony said, and I didn't say it as well as he did, but I tried to say at the start of the talk, that it is about civil society being mobilized. And 
we can choose whatever form of governance we want, and we can do it both through legislative means, but also, you know, pension funds, banks, NGOs can vote shares or tell people how to vote shares. You know, one of the great failures of this whole entire financial crisis was the fact that large shareholders, be they the pension funds or the insurance companies or even foundations, did not exercise their voting rights and control. And we can say, well, that's not good enough, and that's fine, in which case we can legislate public sector involvement or other forms of stakeholders if you want. But the point is we have to take on that problem. But the second thing I would say, just as a matter of fact, is, and again, I, I rarely am in the position of speaking for the high-tech econometricians. Um, the the high-tech econometricians, at least at the Bank of England, are not going into what's called the macroprudential exercise with huge uh, self-confidence. Um, as my colleagues, I have a few colleagues here from the Bank of England can attest, Governor King, who man who's not known for his um, insecurity, um, actually gave a speech in Washington roughly a month ago, Chris, um, in which he basically said, we don't, don't expect too much. We're totally making this up as we go along and we're learning. <laughs> now, that's not to make an excuse. That's just to say that this is why I'm out there pushing, even if it's not satisfying to many members of the panel in this audience, that's why I'm out there pushing for something that I think is practical and automatic in the form of, say, the taxes or certain other restrictions on banking, because I don't really want these clever econometricians having to just sort of pull stuff out of the air, however clever they are. The final thing I would say, just pick up on something Anne raised, um, which also relates to your point about financial repression and, and how we deal with these things. I'm sorry, I'll stop right there. Um, is that, uh, I, I mean, Anne's criticisms of me are legitimate in the sense that she accurately portrays my position for the most part. The one thing which, which, she, which she doesn't get right is I was portraying Reinhard Rogoff as a in much the way you are, as a form of defeatism that we can get past. I, I was not praising Reinhard and Rogoff. I was, I was attacking that point of view, not as scholars, but as that message. And the tagline, if I want you to come away with a bumper sticker, is something some people in the science have heard me say before. One person's financial repression is another person's prudent supervision. And, and so I don't fully agree with Anne's characterization of the golden age, but I do think a key part of it was we did have very extensive heavy duty supervision and there's no reason we can't do that again. <laughs> and did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to sound contrite. <laughs> <laughs> Very okay. <laughs> let's, let's take another question then. What about <coughs> from up Can I here? just make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Because we only have about 15 minutes before we really need to leave, is that we stack up a few questions okay. um, and then answer them or take everybody. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> well, let's, let's start up over here and then we can take one, two, any more, and then over here? Sure. Third. Starting here. Uh, right in front of you, hand up, right there. Thank you. Uh, Raj Samothram, I was very interested to hear uh, Mr. Person just say that one of the greatest failures was the, was the lack of active stewardship ownership by institutional investors. We just had a, a fringe meeting here before this event started on this issue and there was no investment manager who, who could actually come to the room to talk about what investors had learned from the back financial crisis. So I, I kind of want to uh, ask you as pension fund members and customers of insurance companies, as individuals, what would you like your pension fund or your fund manager or your in insurance company to do that they're not doing today? And if they were to turn around to you and say that might reduce some of the spectacular returns they've delivered, what would your answer be? What? <laughs> returns. Okay, we were going to we were going to go here next, and Maroon Shet in the in the middle. Yeah. 
Thanks, uh, Andrew Stevenson. I want to ask um, if, along with Mr. Posen's idea of uh, counter-cyclical taxes to deal with runaway asset prices, we should also have some sort of counter-cyclical taxes to deal with runaway incomes. We haven't heard a mention of <laughs> Uh, the role of inequality leading up to the current crisis. We heard about um, the Case-Shiller Index, and if you look on the measures of rising asset prices that coincide with crises and match the Gini coefficient against that, you can also see that rising inequality leads to crises. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking is, along with the discussions about how we should make sure that the structure of the banking sector is uh, resolved and that banks uh, function in a more socially equitable way, should we also be asking whether you can have a just banking sector in an unjust society, or should we be asking a wider question about inequality? Okay, great question. Thank you. Um, I'm going to take one more here. Is this on? All right. Um, Jasper Sky, Cambridge. Uh, tiny comment, then brief question. The tiny comment, Dr. Posen, Professor Steve Keen over there is a person you might want to speak to this weekend. Uh, he will tell you about property income limited leverage on mortgage lending. Fascinating idea, I think it's very complimentary to yours. Question, there are at least two experts on quantitative easing there. One of them is Dr. Posen, and the other is Dr. Vienna. And um, I would like to ask the following. 325 billion, I think it was, has been created so far in quantitative easing? No? No, I'm shaking my head. I, that's not the topic of this session. <laughs> no, 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 but this is how do we make e things useful, right? How do we create a useful banking system? And the, the, the central bank's part of the banking system. And so what I'm wondering is, with this huge amount of quantitative easing that's been created by, for, for buying assets off the secondary bond markets, um, is there a reason why the central bank in principle could not instead take, let's say, a tenth of that money and buy bonds off of, let's say, a public infrastructure agency that builds, I don't know, wind farms, uh, green infrastructure? <coughs> Uh, why hasn't that been done? I gather that Mervyn King is absolutely opposed to that. I know that Dr. Vanna has actually written in favor of such a me measure, and, uh, and I think Tony Greenham is, is also interested in this. If you could explain to me why this proposal of using the central bank's ability to put things onto its balance sheet, these kinds of bonds, has, has, it's, it's flatly refusing to do anything that's actually useful. Please, okay, please I, I think we get the question. Thanks. We're, we're running quite short on time, so we'll have relatively short questions. I think we'll start with those three and move on. First one is an excellent question. What do you actually want your pension fund manager to do to change things? Should we start? Yeah. I'll, I'm, well, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not really going to answer that question because I'm not entirely convinced that, that pension funds are an efficient way of provisioning for old age. <laughs> and there haven't been any spectacular returns and I think that uh, people don't understand exactly how much of the return is eaten up in charges because of the lack of transparency. And when people start gradually to retire, um, I think it's another great scandal waiting to happen is when people find how little is in their retirement pots. So, but they're, but they're still know. there. They still own vast amounts of, of the UK. They're still the biggest equity shareholders out there, so they do have influence, and we should perhaps encourage them to use that influence. Well, I, I don't have figures on this, but uh, I, I once uh, heard the chief executive of the Prudential in the UK, obviously one of the largest providers of financial products, saying that only one in 10 UK householders were likely to be their customers, because the other 90% don't have any assets or money. And I would just say, please don't speculate with my savings. Okay. <laughs> Richard, Richard, what would you say to your friends and fund manager? Um, I mean, the, the fact that institutional investors have not used their ownership power and the power to vote um, on their, the shares they, they, they don't own that directly, but they're administrators of, um, is nothing new. This is <laughs> what always happens. This has always been like that, because when you have dissipated share ownership, in the hands of institutional investors, that is actually part of part and parcel of this bloated financial sector, um, because they have to trade, they have to invest, they have to give orders to stockbrokers that take clients out, you know, the, um, to the various clubs and and attractive locations, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, you know, I've I've seen it myself, um, and so. I agree with Tony, this is not really, there's a problem with that entire structure. And there's no evidence that ever, um, you know, dissipated share ownership is a way of, uh, of getting socially, um, economically, ecologically, and just um, outcomes. 
So, yes, one, one should, of course, in the current structure, try to push one's own managers, if you had any idea who they are, and usually we don't, uh, to do um, more good with the money. But in practice, they don't have the right incentives to even listen to you. So it's not likely to work. I'm perhaps a bit cynical on this, but it, I think that, that would be barking up the wrong tree. We should reform the banking sector and the whole financial sector, and then the pensions will fall in place. And, and perhaps, yes, we need uh, perhaps to reconsider government-operated um, uh, pension systems and so on. Thanks. Okay, so this panel wouldn't tell their pension fund manager anything. They would, they would just abolish him. <laughs> Anything, Adam, you want to I'll add to that? In the interest of time, I'll skip that <laughs> Okay, one. fine. Uh, the, next, the next one, I think, is a, a truly vital question, this issue of inequality. How do we, how do we deal with inequality as a yeah, problem since, in the UK? Since, since it started off with the very useful reference of carousel taxes, let me just start, and then obviously others should pitch in. Um, at an intellectual level, there's a bit of a complication. And I'm, I'm sorry to sound like a weenie here, but I have to do this. Um, it is possible that a lot of the inequality that arises in these kinds of situations, and the gentleman is right to talk about the parallels of the Gini curve and so forth, are as much effect as cause. It's if you have an underlying cause, which is you let your banking system or whatever privileged industry and group hijack the allocation of capital in your, in your society, then they also understandably grab a lot of money. That doesn't mean, unfortunately, that if you, it's, it's like, you can't, I should come up with a medical uh, analogy, but I can't at the moment. You, you just can't, you're not gonna fix this problem by going after inequality directly. That doesn't mean you shouldn't go after inequality directly. That's probably more important than this problem. Moreover, the inequality does worsen terribly when you have a crisis which is another reason for avoiding boom and bust. We all can agree on that. And for example, the evidence is coming out of Ireland now about the distributional effects of their austerity program and they're paying off their debts is truly frightening. So again, none of this is to say that inequality is not important in its own right and is not linked to the crises and we have to worry about it. It is, however, to say that I think if you start conflating those two issues, you may miss the boat because the important thing for purposes of preventing boom bust and for purposes of dealing with runaway incomes is to say those groups should not have so much power, those groups should not be able to take away that much money. It's not about the inequality per se. Okay. I would agree with, with Adam on, uh, on these points. Um, I would like to add um, that yes, it, inequality in its own right is an important issue. But with all issues, we should ask, what is the ultimate cause? And um, I'm convinced that we will find the single biggest factor internationally in, in, in explaining the variations in inequality is the design of the economic institutions in the country, among which the monetary system must rank as the most important one. So put simply, it is the monetary system that is likely to explain also the differences in inequality. Of course, there are other factors and there are other forms of institutional design that play into this, but the monetary system, as you can imagine, will have the single biggest impact and it will magnify or reduce um, um, other factors. And the monetary system we have is where banks, profit-oriented enterprises, create and allocate the money supply and therefore when we have a, a banking system like in the UK, where we have five banks accounting for 90% of the banking sector, and they're huge, they want to do huge deals, so they give very big loans to a small number of people and firms. That increases inequality. Got to, got to talk faster. And the, if, you, if you have thousands, if you had thousands of small banks lending tiny amounts to everyone in the country, then you'd have less inequality. But perhaps better still, you need to think about, do banks really have to create and allocate the money supply? What about monetary reform? Isn't this a public privilege that belongs to the public and perhaps needs to be returned to the public because it hasn't worked in the banking sector? Okay, this is such an important, we've only got a few minutes left, but it's such an important question. I just want to throw it over to this side. No, I just want to agree with what, both what Adam and Richard have said. I think they're absolutely right. Tony, 
Well, I, I think I would say that um, I would agree with both of those comments, but I actually think that uh, inequality is itself a source of instability in the financial system, because if you get what's happened in the US and uh, Canada and the, and the UK in particular uh, over the last, say, 10, 10 or 15 years, stagnating re real wages, consumption has only been maintained by people borrowing more. And of course, we got to the point where we reached the end of that road, and quite possibly, I think, the only way out of that crunch is going to be some sort of debt forgiveness or debt jubilee, uh, because I can't see how else we're going to get out of it. Now we'll, just, um, we'll just take this last question. Adam, I don't think you want to answer that, that do you? So, Richard, I wonder if you have a, a view on this business of whether QE can be used to, to create a, a useful to fund. Very, very quickly. And I'll try quickly. to speak very fast. Beth and, is looking and really nervous. <laughs> I was actually going to say, I mean, do you guys feel you've got the stamina to carry on? For another sure. As, as, long sure. As, as long as they're willing to put off you drinks. <laughs> Control Drink, and <laughs> <laughs> we we're not going to get kicked out for, okay. for a while, so we can carry on if everybody's okay. Do you, do you want to take a show of hands? Uh, Civil um, society, speak! <laughs> <laughs> Does that carry on? This is for carrying on, all right. <laughs> so, the, so the question was on quantitative easing and whether we shouldn't have a better type of quantitative <laughs> easing that it's more useful to the economy, to society, to the environment. Um, well, in 1994, I went around Tokyo as chief economist of an investment bank, British firm, um, arguing that to get Japan out of this banking bust recession, you need a new type of monetary policy, stimulative monetary policy, of course. Everyone initially thinks lowering interest rates. and the point was no. You, I said at the time you can lower them to zero, that's not going to help. Oh, you mean expanding the money supply, M1, M2, M3? No, that's also not going to help. You have to create more credit. And I was told by the editor, this is an article in the Nikkei, um, that just having credit creation in the headline, nobody will understand this. At the time in English it was, I think, a little known concept, but certainly in Japanese, very little known. And so I had to come up with an expression that referred to the idea that it's, it's a stimulatory monetary policy, but it's different. Um, it's not lowering rates, and it's not expanding the money supply. And I called, I used the standard expression for um, expansionary monetary policy, which literally translated in Japanese is easing, kanwa. Um, and I added the word for quantitative to make clear it's not the price of money, it's not interest rates. So ryoteki. Kanwa or Ryoteki Kinyukawa, quantitative easing. I, I didn't expect this to be literally translated as the Bank of Japan translator did um, into, into English. And then, of course, uh, ultimately the Bank of England adopting In case the you're term. missing the point here, what Rich is telling you is that he invented <laughs> the phrase quantitative easing. Okay? Um, <laughs> but, of course, the way the Bank of Japan and the Bank of England have used it is not the way I defined it namely an expansion in credit creation, which you can do through the central bank, the banking system, or best still, but unlikely, the government. Um, and so, therefore, the policies adopted by the Bank of Japan were not effective. And also, I think the policies by the Bank of England, although much better, and I think they did have a, um, a bigger impact than the Japanese ones, but that was zil, that was zero. So. Um, they're not if they haven't been effective and yes there is much more that can be done you expand the quantity of credit through many ways much more effectively you get the banking system to create credit productively uh, you stop the issuance of government bonds and get the government to borrow from the banking system so overnight you don't have minus four percent credit growth you have plus six percent bank credit growth and you get the bank of england to um to do more. There was actually a question that so far hadn't been addressed. How do we deal with banking crises, I think is the program, um, at the, uh, the least cost, with the least cost to the taxpayer? Well, here's a way of doing this with uh, zero cost, at zero cost to the taxpayer. The Bank of England buys all the um, bad assets in the banking system and Northern Rock and all that. Um, so you don't use tax money. That's how you have zero cost to the taxpayer. You use the central bank to do it. Um, and the central bank doesn't actually create money to do this. You just shift it from the banking system's balance sheet to the central bank balance sheet. Um, and there's no cost. And there's no loss to the central bank either. 
say, so the problem, of course, is that these loans say they were valued at 100, they're worth 10. The central bank buys them for 100, the bank is solvent again. Uh, but isn't the central bank now um, nursing a loss of, of 90? No, it doesn't have a loss, it has a gain of 10. Because it creates money out of nothing to buy this. Uh, doesn't this create inflation? No, you inject no money into the economy. Because you only inject money into the economy when it goes from the banking sector, which is banks plus central bank, into the non-banking economy. And this doesn't inject any money, so also no inflation. Is this radical? Central banks haven't done this before? Of course they've done. When they don't want a recession, then they do it, like the Bank of England in 1914 or the Bank of Japan in 1945. Um, so there are, there are many other examples. And just to add, yes, quantitative easing in a green way can also be done. So the Bank of England could buy solar panels for every household, for example. That's a direct injection into the economy um, of money, which creates a lot of jobs, generates energy, and improves the uh, sort of energy footprint um, of the country, and has a bigger impact. But that's just one example. You can think of many more yourselves, I think. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. And you can tell them that the next meeting. Buy everyone a solar panel, and we're all right. Yeah. With Jasper's question is it leaves, it leaves out a really important process. And the problem with the whole quantitative easing <coughs> debate is that it's one tool, but it's only one tool, but it doesn't work unless it's linked to other tools, and in particular to fiscal policy. The question is not so much the creation of money, because we know money can be created endlessly. There's never a shortage of money in a monetary system, a, system, a monetary financial system. I've worked in countries in Africa where there ain't no financial monetary system and where it's really hard to create credit. But in a, a system like our own, it's really easy. There's never any shortage of credit for anything. There's a big shortage, though, of how and where to spend it and who should spend it. And right now, the private sector, effectively, is refusing to spend for very good reason. It's buried in debt, buried by the banking system in debt. Individuals, households, firms are not spending, not investing. Um, they've got to deleverage their balance sheets. They've got to clean up their uh, problems before they can risk any other kind of expenditure. So what happens in those circumstances is that the only institution that can spend is government. And the proper way this should work, and it's working this way already, the Bank of England is effectively financing the deficit. I think it was two days ago that the Bank of England bought $1.5 billion worth of uh, government gilts. By doing so, it's showing us that the, the government is not dependent on so-called bond markets, <coughs> the global capital markets. The Bank of England is buying these gilts, albeit through, other, through private banks, and financing the deficit. And then it's up to Mr. Davy, I think his name is, Ed Davy. Is, uh, is he not the Secretary of State for the Environment? who runs a department where there is some expertise in the whole business of energy, management of energy supplies and energy security and wind farms and solar panels. You know. um, and that's the way the transmission sh system should work. It doesn't just work with a single tool, monetary policy. Where do you stand, Tony, on getting your own solar panel off the Bank of England? <laughs> Well, I, I, I do have some views, but in the interest of time, is, is Adam going to... Sorry, uh, uh, Adam's not going to comment. Okay. Um, well, I, I sort of agree that I, I don't think the Bank of England, it, it, as an institution, should be the one that, that is um, sort of deciding uh, that, uh, that micro level <laughs> you know, what QE might end up being spent on. But I, I personally see... <sighs> My understanding of the reason why the bank only wants to buy gilts is it wants to feel that it's a completely neutral about how uh, the, the, the private sector then will allocate uh, you know, its capital across which, which sectors because it's best place to, to sort of decide to do that. I think the idea that the um, capital markets are uh, efficient at allocating uh, capital um, in the light of um, the, the, the boom and the 2008 crash is a heroic assumption, frankly. Um, and, I, and I don't see, I think, I think you could easily create a sort of halfway between um, Richard and Anne would be that uh, the bank does, as it currently does, the Monetary Policy Committee might decide a quantity of QE, which it considers needs to be uh, made available to counteract deflation. A separate body, perhaps within the Treasury, but publicly accountable with a remit, 
could then suggest how that, that quantity, what assets should be purchased. So out of 25 billion, you might say, well, this body thinks 15 billion should be into bonds going into sort of green investment, another 5 billion into school infrastructure or something, and 5 billion just into, into guilt, say. And, and I think, I, I see no technical reason why you couldn't set up such a body, and I don't really see any reason in economics why that, that, that couldn't. Um, if the objective is to counter deflation, then uh, I don't see why you shouldn't have more of a hand in trying to figure out where this money is being injected into the economy and for what. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm, I'm agreeing with your but suggestion. That, but that means why doesn't the Bank of England simply bypass government in the democratic process? No, that it does. It does. Yeah, no, no, it, sorry, this is the one point where I'm going to have to come in. I'm totally with Anne's statement on this. It's not about the economics. It's about accountability. I and my fellow pinheaded te technocrats who are appointed by officials but who are basically independent we, we have a deal with the British people that we, you can never do anything that's without redistributive consequences, as the gentleman previously pointed out. But there is nothing to impede your elected officials from saying, instead of doing X with the budget, whether whatever size you choose to make the budget, which is again an issue your elected officials do, they can choose how much of it to spend on that. I have no business. It's not about, you can make additional arguments about we're not good at deciding these things, it's distortionary, we might lose money, but they're all secondary. It's all about what Ann said. I am not an elected official. If you want money, there's nothing to say that if, if the Bank of England, excuse me, if the MPC chooses to buy bonds, there's absolutely nothing constraining the elected officials from choosing to spend that on green infrastructure or choosing to spend that on pay count, paying down debt. And you really don't want, no, hold on. I'm not saying I don't, I am indifferent as a citizen, but I am saying, you can make whatever face you like, I as a central banker have no business getting involved in that. Really? Okay, I I think we might call an end to that. And I, I, I want to just come back to that also, to the, the whole point about setting up new institutions, which Adam raised in his speech to do this. We really don't need to do that. Right. We can require existing banks to provide Jasper or whoever is asked after this money with the finance needed for investment in a green economy. And I actually think that's what we really must do. Now, you know, it might be hard to persuade HSBC and, and Lloyds to do that, but those, those banks are really dependent on public finance, and they're very dependent on the Bank of England setting interest rates at 0.5% or whatever it is that they borrow at. So the public subsidy to those banks is massive, and we should be saying, right, we're in favour of supporting the banking system, we don't think it's a good idea for it to crash and collapse, but there are terms and conditions. And the terms are condition, and conditions are thou shalt lend to the green sector at sustainable low rates of interest. Or else, all taxpayer guarantees, all taxpayer backups are immediately off the table. That's all we have to do. We don't have to invent a new institution. Okay, thank you, thank you. Now, um, I'm going to allow Richard to make one more comment on this issue. Um, just to point out the fact that, I mean, although there's the impression, and, and central banks like to give the impression that they're neutral and they only buy government bonds, um, central banks also buy securities issued by private sector firms. Um, and I have the pamphlet, and you can get the pamphlet by, by the Bank of England on QE, and it says QE is effectively, and they, they have the definition there, purchasing government securities and securities issued by private sector firms. Now, I don't know to what extent they've done that, but if they also bought private sector debt and, and securities, they would be in good company. All central banks have done that historically always, and they do make decisions. We buy those firms' assets, uh, securities. We don't buy anything issued by that firm. So th there's always been an element of selection, also of private sector money flows. Just think of bill rediscounting, which has been the main business of central banks. I think we might have to call it an end there. I think my panel's beginning to get exhausted and, and, and ratty. They might start having proper goes at each other soon. So I think we'll have to <laughs> call the whole there. Thank you very much for being such a brilliant audience. And uh, I hope we'll be going to more of the conference. <laughs>